Um, so, what does it mean we have four qubits and we want to measure the observable, which, uh, well, I'm, I'm representing it using a, a picture here, but it's the observable that you could write as something like Z, J, Z, K, Z, L, Z, M for qubits J, K, L, and M sitting around the placket. What does that even mean? Um, well, when in the case that we were measuring uh, just Z, J, Z, J plus one, we did this with this, um, what I will now always think of as the enterprise circuit, where we have uh, a couple of controlled knots for these two qubits, J and J plus one. So there is the bridge. Hello, Captain Picard. Uh, so what you might think is, well, all we need to do to make it a four qubit version is to have more qubits having controls. And um, well, we won't prove that that's the case, but that is exactly what it is. OK, actually here I called it I, J, K, and L, so I should have used that. Uh, but if we have four qubits, i, j, k, and l, and we want to make this measurement, then all we do is implement this circuit. We take our additional qubit, uh, initialized in state zero, and we do four controlled knots, each controlled on one of the qubits that we are doing this measurement of, so one of the qubits around the plaquette, and each targeted on the uh, ancilla, which you can think of as the ancilla sitting in the middle of the plaquette. Um, which is usually where it actually does sit in, in any physical realization. And then you do these four controlled knots and you measure at the end. So what does this tell us? When will this be zero and when will this be one? Well, if these are all zero, 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 then none of these controlled knots do anything. This initial zero remains zero and we get a zero. So one of the cases where it's zero is when these are all zero. Another case is this one that we see on the example uh, where, where two of them are one. It doesn't matter which two, but in this case, it's this one and this one that are one. And in that case, these two controlled knots do do something. So the only reason why these are orange instead of blue is just to, to highlight them because they do something. They're not different controlled knots in any way. So this looks at this one, and then it does an X on the ancilla. This looks at a zero, does nothing. This looks at a zero, does nothing. This looks at the one and does an X on the ancilla. So in terms of what the ancilla is seeing there, it is seeing uh, zero, and then it is seeing a couple of Xs um, from those two controlled knots that did something. And then it gets measured. So what does it get measured as? Well, zero after an X is flipped to one, and one after an X gets flipped back to zero. So we get a zero out here. And what we indeed find is in any case where we have an even number of ones, uh, we get an even number of flips, and so we get a zero. Uh, however, on the other case, whenever we have an odd number of ones, we get an odd number of flips. So in this case, we have one, one, we get one flip, and therefore the ancilla comes out as one. So the outcome of this measurement, whether it's zero or one, is telling us about whether we have an odd or even number of ones around the bracket. So before we just had two things being compared, we were just comparing two qubits and we were comparing them to see if they were, oh, shouldn't have copied it, because now I've got all of this nonsense. Not calling the enterprise nonsense. Uh, so before we just had two values, um, we had uh, two values and we were seeing whether they were the same, which gave us a zero, or whether they were different, which gave us a one um, in the thing that we were measuring. Whereas in this case, what it's doing is measuring the, measuring the parity over four. So for anything where we have an even number of ones, so that's, uh, sorry, that's uh, zero, 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 zero around the plaquette, or zero, one, one, zero, 
or one, 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 or anything else. In those cases, we get a zero. In any case that we have odd, uh, then we, we get a one. So it's telling us whether we have even or odd parity around the black end. Why is that useful? Well, that's what we'll, we're going to find out. Uh, we are measuring, basically, we are looking at plaquettes and we're measuring whether we have an even or odd parity around those plaquettes. And we're currently looking at the all of the possible states there are with an even parity around all of the plaquettes. And what we can uh, deduce is, well, easily this is one of them, but one thing we can find is there's basically two different families of such states. Um, there's a family for which if you take a line from top to bottom, um, if you take a line from top to bottom, where's the, the nice thing I've got? If you take any line from top to bottom that goes through the qubits and goes along the gray lines here, it doesn't matter what line you pick, but it just has to go along these gray lines and go from top to bottom, then for any state within this family, which starts off at the all zero state, and then uh, we pick a vertex and we flip everything around it, all of them will have an even parity for such a line from top to bottom. <clears throat> and uh, we can generate an, a, an equivalent family of states uh, where if you go for a line from top to bottom, and it could also be a nice straight line, it will have odd parity. So it will have an odd number of ones instead of an even number of ones. And what we're going to do is use these even parity um, states to encode our zero and use these odd parity states to encode our one. Now, the nice thing about this is that it's not so easy to distinguish between zero and one. Um, in the repetition code, if uh, someone came along and measured one of your qubits, then they would instantly know whether you're encoding a zero or a one, and that would ruin your superposition straight away. But here, measuring just one of your qubits is not enough to know whether you're storing a zero or a one. If you measure this one and find it zero, and you conclude that you're encoding a zero, well, you'd be wrong because you're encoding a one. Um, so, uh, this is basically the encoding that we use, and it will be a bit more complicated when we get to the full code. But this is, but even when we get to the full surface code, which is all entangled and quantum and all kinds of fanciness, these facts still hold true. So, given that this is how we encode zero and one, how how do we detect the difference between a zero and a one? Well, what we could do is choose a line of qubits from top to bottom and measure them, and then look at the parity of the result. So at that point, we don't care about collapsing superpositions anymore because we actually want to measure it. Uh, what we could do is just measure a line from top to bottom, count the parity. If it's even, we've encoded a zero. If it's odd, we've encoded a one. So we're doing Z measurements on a line from top to bottom. Uh, so this is a thing to keep in mind for later. Uh, also, if we want to flip the value, if we want to flip an encoded zero into an encoded one or vice versa, well, the difference between an encoded zero and an encoded one is that we've got to um, find drive across through the plaquettes uh, a line from left to right and flip um, zeros to ones, such that when we go for a line from top to bottom, it flips from even to odd for whatever line we choose. So, uh, so we pick a line from left to right, and we do X gates along all of those qubits, and that is what our logical X looks like. Okay, so these are the, uh, this is the encoding that we use when we look at only plaquettes. And we can also think about what are the effects of errors. Well, if an X error was to occur anywhere, what does an X error do? Uh, let me get myself a nice blank bit of screen. Well, if we have uh, a plaquette and everything around that plaquette is a zero and we have next to it another plaquette for which everything around that plaquette is a zero and it doesn't they don't have to be all zeros it could be anything with an even parity but if you come along and do an error which flips that to a one then suddenly both of these have odd parity so the effect of your error was to spawn two plaquettes next to each other, a pair of plaquettes 
with odds parity, which is very much like when you have flip a bit in the repetition code that the um, the two parity checks either side will flag up something going on. Except that in this case, the error, um, it's in a two-dimensional form. So if the error happening here causes this pair, an error happening um, well here would cause parity changes on this pair. If you have a pair of errors like this and this, then this would cause a parity change here and here. And this causes a parity change here and here, but because that, that's already been changed, it changes back, and that's why we see this sort of configuration. So basically, whenever an X error happens, it, it causes changes in the parity of these plaquettes, and that is the signal, that is the clue that we use to determine what's going on. Okay, now let's move on to a code. Let's forget these plaquette syndromes and move on to a code entirely done by the vertex syndromes. And for this, um, it's exactly the same, but it, we have X's instead. So we're measuring in the X basis. We're not anymore measuring. Um, so usually when we do a measurement, we just do a measurement and that uh, takes the zero state and turns it into a result zero and takes the one state and turns it into the result one. Instead, we're gonna do what's called an X measurement. Uh, so for that, we can implement that by first doing a Hadamard and then doing a measurement. And um, this turns the, the result plus into zero. So we'll get a zero if our qubit is in state plus, or it takes minus and turns that into one. So it's an X measurement that we're doing now. We're looking at parity in the X basis. So instead of in terms of zeros and ones, we're doing it in terms of pluses and minuses. Um, so in this case, the way we do it, well, we can we can do it in this in this form. So we're instead of our wanting our control knots to look at whether the control is zero and, or one, and do uh, and so maybe. Just uh, to point out that the plus state is the one that is uh, one over the square root of two, zero plus one, and the minus state is the one which has a minus in there instead. So we're now distinguishing between these two states, and we want our controlled not to do nothing if the, it is controlled on a plus state and do something do an X if it's controlled on a minus state. And we can do that simply by putting a couple of Hadamards in here, uh, because the effect of the Hadamard is to turn zeros into pluses and pluses into zeros. So it's just basically like a switch we can do. We turn the switch to actually controlled not please be controlled on plus and minus instead of zero and one and then we do the controlled not and then we do another hadamard to switch back to normal mode so by doing exactly the same sort of uh, circuit as before but this time with hadamards here then we are not counting the parity of pluses and minuses oh, sorry zeros and ones but we're counting the parity of pluses and minuses if there's an even number of minuses it gives a zero. If there's an odd number of minuses, it gives a one. Uh, so similarly, we can we can think about what are the states for which all of these vertex uh, measurements are happy. W what are the states for which they all have an even number of ones around them, uh, minuses around them, sorry. So this is one, for example. It's the one with pluses everywhere. And this is another which is the one where you, you drive a line this time from top to bottom and flip them all to minuses. So let's take these also as being uh, representing two big exponentially large families of states. Um, and we, we encode different values. Actually, we're going to encode our logical plus state in this, and our, we're going to associate our logical minus state uh, with that. Um, so if we were to do this, then what? How would we do a logical Z? So what is a logical? We often talk about the logical X as being the operation which flips a zero to a one or a one to a zero. But Z also has a similar effect. It flips plus to minus. It flips minus to plus. 
So if we want to take a state which belongs to this exponentially large family of things that we associate with plus and um, flip it to a state which we associate with minus, how do we do it? Well, we can take a line from top to bottom and flip all of those pluses to minuses by doing a z, a z, a z, a z. So our logical z, which flips between pluses and minuses, is a line from top to bottom made up of z. And how do we distinguish between these two things? Well, we have to choose a line from left to right, this time that goes through plaquettes rather than along the lines, and assess how many, the parity. So anything within the family, family we associate with encoding plus has an even number of minuses, and for minus it has an odd number. So we're going along and measuring this time in the x basis to look at pluses and minuses and looking at the parity of that, uh, which corresponds to this measurement of lots of x's along from left to right. So these are our logical operators for this encoding, which coincidentally are exactly the same as before. And that's a very important point that we'll make use of. So before putting it all together, let's look at the effects of errors on this. Now, if we the effects of errors will be that, um, well, we might have an, a pair of plaquettes which are perfectly happy. Make, perhaps they've got plus states all around. And um, so you look at both of them, and they'll both tell you even parity, good, even parity, good. Now, let's say you come along and do an X error here. Well, x acting on plus gives you plus, so it does nothing. It doesn't detect the x error. But what if you did a z error here? z acting on plus gives you minus. So if you apply a z error here, then this qubit becomes minus. And therefore, when you look at the parity of these two vertices, there'll be an E, there'll be an odd number of minuses around this one. So your syndrome measurement will say it's an odd number. Something has gone wrong. So here we see that these kinds of measurements are detecting not X errors, but Z errors, which is something that um, the, the repetition code was sorely lacking. And so if you have a Z error happen here, it will flag up either side. And again, if you have chains of Z, Z errors, um, you'll find a signature of those on the endpoints. Okay. Now, I think I had to, I'm having to go through this at a bit too fast a pace. So when I say, are there any questions? I'm sure there will be some, but let's ask anyway. Are there any questions? There are many. Um, I would say we'll take one just for the sake of time. Yeah. I apologize. I was just eating a, a spoonful of Cheerios as you said that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot of people are in the chat actually talking to each other about the vertices that you're you're discussing here. Um, I kind of want to take a question from the chat and not one from the questions and answers because that area is a little outdated in terms of questions. Those are from about a half hour ago. Yeah. So if anyone in the chat has one they want to share right now, go ahead and type it. And I'll give you about 10 seconds. If not, we'll just go straight back to the lecture. And all right, it seems nothing coming up in the chat right now. So uh, James, we'll give it back to you and save your, if you do have a question, just put it in that ask a question. And if we have time, we'll get to it at the end. Thanks. Okay. So I'm going to put now an amazing example of a state. This is actually a, a Bell state, uh, which you may have seen before somewhere because it's a very fancy type of state. And um, so this is a very interesting state in that uh, if you write it in terms, this is the same state, both lines, these are equal. If you write it in terms of zeros and ones, then it's a superposition of the two even parity states. And if you write it in terms of pluses and minuses, it is also the superposition of two even parity states. And you can use, do a little exercise yourself using the fact that you can substitute zero for plus, plus, minus, or 
or the other way around uh, to verify this for yourself. Uh, but what it means is that it is possible to have things that are of definite parity, in this case, definitely even parity, in the Z basis, so for the zero and one states, and simultaneously for that same state to also have the property that it has definite parity in the X basis. So you cannot actually do this for a single qubit, because for a single qubit, definite parity in the Z basis means like being zero, for example. And if you are zero, and you then write that in terms of pluses and minuses, then you are a superposition of odd and even parity for x. So it's not possible for a single qubit, but for pairs of qubits, it is possible, and also for larger numbers of qubits. And what we find here is that when we're measuring uh, these particular observables, uh, we are measuring the parity of x's along of the z, the z parity, so in terms of zeros and ones, along a plaquette, and we're measuring um, the x parity for vertices. And so on these two qubits where they overlap, it's a pair, they, well, they overlap on a pair of qubits. So even though you might expect that this thing measuring x basis and this thing measuring the z basis don't play very well together, because they overlap on a pair of qubits and because we know that they do play well together on pairs of qubits they do play well together so it means that you can measure the plaquette uh, observables the the plaquette st uh, syndrome and you can measure the vertex syndrome um, at the same time and they they won't mess each other up often in quantum mechanics we have this effect that when we measure things they mess up other things but in this case, these have been defined such that they do not mess each other up. You can measure the plaquette um, syndrome, and you can measure the vertex syndrome, and they will perfectly happily coexist with each other. That means that the plaquette syndrome can be, can be detecting bit flips, and the vertex syndrome can be detecting phase flips, things like a Z error. Uh, and they can do those jobs at the same time in parallel both detecting different types of errors that are occurring on our system. So everything that we've just gone through in these two individual pictures, we can now put together. Uh, however, it means that our zero is not encoded as this or this or this or this. In order for us to have the, a state which does not only have even parity on all plaquettes, but also even parity for the X basis on all vertices, no single set of zeros or ones will 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 do this. And instead, you need this superposition. This superposition of all of the possible ways that we could have encoded a zero before uh, will have it such that if you look at any plaquette, you'll get even parity. But also, and I, I don't think we'll be able to, to show why this is, if you look at a vertex, uh, it'll also be even parity. So this is a huge highly entangled state, especially if we're using thousands of qubits in the code. The code consists of highly complex entangled states, and that's what our zero looks like. This is a single qubit in the very, so a single qubit, which you might think is boring, in the very, in the very simple state of zero, which you might think is boring, and yet what that, that's just at the logical qubit level. If you look at the physical qubit, it is this entire grid of highly entangled uh, qubits, which is kind of kind of awesome. And if you want to do logical operations on this, then it's just the same logical operations that we saw before because they work so well together. If you want to flip zero to one uh, at a logical level, you pick a line from left to right and do bit flips. If you want to do um, flip plus to minus, then at a logical level, you do a line from top to bottom and do this. These are the ways that you can do logical operations, and a nice thing is that if there's any issues in any of these operations, if, there, if there's any noise, then that noise gets instantly seen by all of these check operators which are constantly checking for noise. Because these are being repeated constantly exactly as they were in the repetition code. Um, so then the other thing to say, okay, let's skip on final readout. Um, so decoding is also, it's creating pairs of things as we saw earlier. So it's it's actually a generalization of what's going on 
in the case of the uh, you know of the repetition code. Um, yeah, this is the most important thing to say though. Actually, it's not going to be that our error is some little gremlin sitting there um, doing a either an X hitting a hammer, hitting our qubit with a hammer and doing an X with probability PX or a Y with probability PY or a Z with probability PZ. It's actually going to be something more general. It's going to be some error operation which has a component of identity, which means nothing, plus X plus um, um, Y, so CY I should have here. plus Z, which is really going to create a big, horrible, horrible, big supervisionary thing. Uh, but if we think about how that would be applied on our code, well, we know that if we apply an X on our code, then what it does is it gets seen, it changes the parity of um, two plaquettes and gets uh, detected in that way. We know that if we do a Z on our code, it changes the X parity of two vertices and gets detected in that way. A Y, because Y can be written as a combination of X and Z, will do both of these things and will get detected by both types of syndrome. Identity will do nothing. So if you do have this more general type of error happening on a qubit, it will create a superposition of a state where you have nothing wrong you you have an X error which you detect, you have a Y error which you detect, or you have a Z error which you detect. And then you, you measure the syndrome and it has to collapse to one of these things. And this is not a superposition you want, this is a superposition that errors of course, you don't care about destroying it. And it collapses a superposition to it either having been an X, a Y, a Z, or nothing. Uh, so even though errors are much more general than just some gremlin sitting there hitting it with an X, Y, or Z. Um, instead, uh, the way that we, we measure for errors and the way that measurements in quantum mechanics uh, collapse superpositions means that it just kind of snaps to the co closest Pauli error. And then it causes it, that's something easy that we can go in there and correct. So by detecting errors, then we make errors actually a lot simpler. And that's part, that's a huge part of the power of quantum error correction. Okay, so um, this is this is basically what I need to say. There's some details about decoding that people that you could be look into if you're interested when you get the uh, when you get the slides. Uh, there's also probably the last thing to spend the last few minutes on. It's a notion of a uh, of a threshold. So uh, the bigger we make the code, uh, two things happen. One, uh, in, we have a bigger encoding. We have it, uh, like more space to be able to look at what errors are happening and um, get a clearer picture of what's going on and do better decoding and have more chance to correct errors. So in, what, in one aspect, building bigger codes is good. But in another respect, the bigger you build a code, uh, the more likelihood there is that something bad is going to happen because there's more qubits, there's more, there's more places where bad things ca can happen. So the probability that some big, horrible um, error structure that is completely fatal and will destroy us no matter how good our decoding is, the probability of that will increase. Uh, so you've got to weigh up these two aspects. And what you find is it depends strongly on how how likely the noise is. If noise is rare, then the dominant effect is that making a code bigger makes everything better. And if noise is common, then the dominant effect is that making a code bigger means you get more horrible noise. And then what you find is that there, that causes there to be what we call an error threshold. For any given code, there's what we call an error threshold. If the errors if the strength of the noise is below that threshold, then that is the point at which making the code as big as you want is always better. And so you can, you can reduce the errors on the logical qubits down as far as you want by just making the, the code bigger. And then we can build our absolutely, pretty much almost completely perfect logical qubits that we need 
to do algorithms like Shor's algorithm. Um, so what we need is the ability to build codes as big as possible, but we also need um, to be able to get our noise right, uh, get our noise the noise on our physical qubits below the threshold. Once it's below the threshold, error correction can basically take over. Um, so all, our big challenge is making sure that we get it below the threshold. Um, so yes, that is what I have to say. There is no final thanks for listening slide uh, because um, I included a whole bunch of stuff so I could go on for as long as I wanted. So let me just make one here. Thanks for, this is my handwriting, sorry about it, listening. Okay, thank you.